Hey, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm happy to be at the .NET Conference 2003 to present about uh, From Databases to API. I'm Davide Mauri. I'm part of the Azure SQL Database uh, Engineering Group. And what I would like to show you today is Data API Builder, a solution we have built uh, so that you can take your database and turn it into API, REST, and GraphQL API just in a second, so you don't have to worry about uh, creating it anymore. So let's start with a very common architecture. Uh, it may seem complex, but it's actually very uh, common and very frequent to see this architecture uh, uh, in, uh, in customer's implementation. Uh, basically, you have a database uh, that serves as your data backend, one or more actually, and then you have an API layer that allows the frontends or other services uh, to connect and query the database and apply business logic on the data. That is, stored, that is stored in the database. And uh, how the API and the front end uh, works with each other uh, or uh, allow other uh, devices to connect to your databases, like a mobile application or a web front end, uh, is done through usually through REST and GraphQL API. Uh, GraphQL is becoming more popular. Uh, REST is definitely the de facto standard today. Uh, but the, the, the main point here is that uh, every time you, you need to give someone access to your database, probably you are going to create a CRUD service that allows uh, a front end or another service uh, to basically operate on the data on your database. And building that uh, backend is kind of complex in the sense that probably it's not the most exciting thing, but still needs to be done uh, uh, correctly and, uh, and with performance and security in mind. So it takes some time, even though it's not exactly rocket science, right? So what we have built uh, is a way to completely solve this problem once and for all. So you don't have to worry about uh, creating a backend for your databases anymore. It will work on SQL Server and Azure SQL, as you see in the, this picture. But it will also work uh, on Postgres, MySQL, and Cosmos DB. Uh, so you really have uh, all the option uh, uh, to, to choose the database that most suits your workload and, uh, and uh, use Data API Builder to turn the database into REST and a GraphQL endpoint. Now, in my demo and in my session, I will be focusing, of course, on a simpler architecture. But again, it's very uh, common and applicable even to uh, the, the most complex architecture, the more complex architecture I've shown before. So basically, you have a SQL database behind the scene. I have a web app. And what I want to do is allow this web app in a perfect full stack or even better, jump stack architecture allow to get the data from a database in a JSON format uh, just using regular REST uh, or better um, HTTP verbs. So post, get, put, patch, and delete for, for what concern REST and post for what concern GraphQL and uh, make the web app application available uh, and able to communicate with the database. Uh, I want to support GraphQL. I also want to support OpenAPI and REST. And that's exactly what I'm going to do in a few minutes, as you will see, thanks to the API Builder. Now, the API Builder, now probably you already understand uh, what it is, but I just want to uh, dive a little bit deeper into it, uh, is uh, a tool built in .NET 6, but soon to be moved to .NET 8, that instantly provides REST and GraphQL endpoints for tables, view storage procedure, if you are using Azure SQL or SQL Server, and if you are using a non-relational database, also collections. And for every object exposed, it supports pagination, sort, sorting, filtering, selection, and if you are using GraphQL, even navigation between a relationship. So it really gives you full access to the power of your database, but using modern uh, endpoint and modern protocols. Now, once you have uh, done something like that, usually you are already happy, but then come your boss and says, hey, what about security? What about scalability? What about the best practices? Well, uh, we have already backed everything into the API Builder for you. So security is already taken care of. Uh, we provide authentication via Auth2, uh, basically using Azure Active Directory at the moment. Uh, and uh, if you are deploying uh, the API Builder in Azure using static apps, we also support uh, Easy Auth. So you can use GitHub, Twitter, OpenID, and in general, all the providers supported by Easy Auth. 
And after you have been authenticated, uh, the TP Builder will receive the token, and the token contains claims, claims that can be used uh, in the TP Builder to define uh, row level uh, security or item level security if you are using a NoSQL database. So you can really make sure that uh, only those who are authorized and have the proper uh, claims can access the data that you expose via the TP Builder. For what concerns deployment, again, super easy. You, the TP Builder is open source and free to use, so you can just host it uh, uh, on premises if you want. You can run it in a container, you can write it, run it in a VM, or you can deploy it in Azure. And again, uh, in Azure, you can deploy it in a container if you want, using, for example, Azure Container Apps or even a web app, or you can deploy uh, using static web apps, where you don't actually even have to deploy the TP Builder because uh, static web apps has been integrated with the TP Builder, so you don't really have to deploy anything you just have to configure it and that makes it super easy for you to uh, create a full stack application uh, in a in a breeze and uh, and that's pretty much it uh, in six seven minutes i basically described exactly what data api builder is and how it will make your life uh, much much more uh, simpler and fun and uh, and before moving to a demo right now i just want to give you um, a bit of an overview of how the api builder works so you see on the left side, you have uh, the sources that the TPA Builder uh, uses. It can be a relational database or it can be a NoSQL database. And if you are using a relational database, basically we will use the relational schema already uh, inherently uh, available in database uh, to understand uh, what kind of GraphQL schema we need to generate if you want to use GraphQL or what kind of result will be returned by your REST endpoint and thus generate the open API uh, documentation if you are using REST. If you are using a NoSQL database, you have to provide that information via configure an additional configuration file. Otherwise, you just have a, a configuration file that simply tell the API builder what tables, view, or storage procedure needs to be exposed uh, as a REST on GraphQL endpoint. Because of course, we don't want to expose your entire database by default. Actually, we want to be secure by default. Uh, so we will only expose uh, the thing, the, uh, the entities, so tables, again, view store procedure that you tell us to expose in the configuration file you can see here. Okay. So um, then the data API builder reads the schema of the database or the provided schema if you're using a NoSQL database, the configuration file, and then uh, in memory during the runtime, it basically creates an abstraction and generates this schema that can be used both to expose the REST method with full open API documentation support or GraphQL schema that is needed uh, to support the proper GraphQL queries. And that's pretty much it. Uh, how to use it? It's super simple, just four commands. First of all, you need to install the TP Builder doing .NET tool install, as you can see in the screen. And then you can initialize the, the configuration file that is the, really the only thing needed by the TP Builder in addition to the database, of course. So you specify dub init, specify the type of database you want to use and the connection string. And then you add the entity that you want to be published as a graph, uh, QL and REST endpoint, specifying what is the table or the view or the storage procedure on which that entity is based and the permission. In this case, in the example here, I'm exposing the session table, uh, making sure that anyone can do anything. So can update, delete, uh, and create a new session via both REST and GraphQL. And then it's done. You just do dub start and that's it. That's, that's done. The endpoint is running. So enough with the slide. Let's move to the demo now. As demo database, I prepared a database that contains sessions and speaker information of the .NET conference. So we have a session table here, uh, pretty regular, with the title, abstract, and other information. The speakers table, where you have the speakers, and uh, a table that joins uh, or allows the session and the speakers to be joined together in a many-to-many -many relationship uh, where you have the session uh, ID and the speaker ID for that session. So you can have uh, one session uh, being presented by many speaker and a uh, speaker presenting in many sessions. So a typical many-to-many -many relationship uh, sustained by a linking table called session speakers here. Now, just to uh, get confident uh, with the data. I have prepared uh, some uh, query here where I am starting from the session, uh, connecting uh, 
and using the session speaker table and then going to the speakers to find what are the speakers, who are the speakers of the Welcome to .NET 8 session. And as you can see, we have a bunch of them. Let's take uh, David Fowler, for example. And then here I'm doing exactly the same. So connecting, uh, starting from the session, going through the session speaker table and the speakers, uh, and then filtering for our friend David Fowler. And uh, again, if I run this here, I will find that David is uh, speaking in two sessions. Great. Now, what I want to do is uh, publish this table so that uh, I can also build a front end for my database and create a simple website where people can look and search and uh, learn about the session and the conference. So what I'm doing right now is uh, opening the studio code. I already prepared an HTML file where basically in this case, I just really went plain. I didn't use React. There is uh, an example I will discuss later that uses React, but here I just uh, went with plain and vanilla JavaScript where basically I'm executing a uh, GraphQL query, which is basically nothing else by that, uh, than a post fetch, and uh, and then uh, uh, loading uh, a list uh, with the function with the result of the query, which contains the session that has a certain title, or all the session if I don't specify the title. So what uh, would normally happen right now is that uh, I have the front end. It's a simple, but still I have a nice front end. And now I normally what would happen is that I have to build the back end and then you know make sure that uh, I correctly handle the incoming GraphQL request or the REST request, build the query, execute the query, return the result, package the result into JSON, and send it back to the front end for uh, visualizing it. Well, with DTP Builder is very easy because uh, I just have to create a configuration file and DTP Builder will take care of everything for me. So let me um, just open the terminal here, clear the terminal, and uh, let's uh, start to initialize DTP Builder. So all I have to do is dub init, then I specify the database I want to use. I will be in development mode, meaning that I have more logs so we can see what happened behind the scene and the connection string that I will be taking from the environment variable I already set. By the way, the environment variable can be read from the environment file. It's very easy if you already are used to use environment file to make sure that the configuration file doesn't contain any, any sensitive data. Okay, we have uh, the configuration file right now. It's nothing more of just that a bunch of information for the runtime to understand if REST and GraphQL are supported, uh, information about the host uh, and uh, entities. That's the interesting part. Entities are empty right now because by default, DTP Builder doesn't publish anything unless you specify it to do so. So let's do that. Let's uh, say that I want to publish the session and the speaker uh, table. So let's do dub add. And now we start with the speaker. I specify, and that's just a name that will be used to identify this object. And as a GraphQL type name, um, the source is the source of our data. In this case, the table, speakers, uh, permission means that anyone can do anything. Let's just say that I want to limit it to read. And then rest is the path at which the speaker object will be made available for rest request. Now, uh, as you can see, automatically the DAB configuration file has been updated with a bunch of data. Again, the source, uh, GraphQL configuration, uh, REST configuration, and permission. Nice. Let's now add uh, the session table. So session, and I'm doing exactly the same. Uh, so defining the source, uh, setting the permission, uh, uh, defining uh, the path at which REST, uh, uh, the REST uh, will answer and we're good to go. Now I can do dub start and my table is already, my both my table already up and running. And in fact, I can open here. I can, I can go for example to GraphQL and uh, here I already have prepared some, some queries. Let me start from the session and here I want to, uh, let's start saying uh, I want to see all the sessions and here we go. We have all the session available. This is our table just exposed as a GraphQL endpoint right now. I can, I can also filter for some specific title. In this case, let's just take a look at the uh, session uh, uh, with title Welcome to .NET 8. Um, but of course, here I don't see the speakers, right? Because 
yeah, speakers is another table. So I, I have to find a way to connect the session to the speakers because otherwise I need to query the speakers on their own. Again, I can do that, query the speakers object. And, uh, and in this case, I'm filtering for a, a specific speaker. But again, also here, I don't have any session that I ask uh, to GraphQL to return, uh, given that speaker, right? And that's because I haven't created yet the relationship between the two objects. And actually, the, the, the relationship exists at the database level. There is a foreign key, but I haven't surfaced it in the TP Builder. And remember, by default, we don't publish anything. Data API Builder doesn't publish anything unless you specify and you exp explicitly ask it to do so. Uh, that's for security reason, obviously. So that's why we need to manually uh, surface the relationship. Now, before going to changing the uh, configuration file, let me also go here and go to Swagger. So you can also see that now the speakers and the session are also available as a uh, uh, open API endpoint. So for example, let's go and take all the speaker, let's execute, here we go. This is the curl uh, command and these are all the speakers that I have in my database. Of course, I could also just go here to API slash speakers and I would have had the same result without using Swagger. And of course, also here I can also filter or take, for example, only the first five, for example, or apply filters. And that's it. So everything is already done. As you can see also, there is pagination here. So if I go to this page, I will get the next five speakers and so on and so forth. Okay, cool. Everything is now clear, both on GraphQL and REST. We can go back and um, try to understand how we can now connect the speaker to the session and have the ability to ask for all the special give, uh, session given a specific speaker or all the speaker that will be speaking at a session. To do that, I have to go back to Visual Studio. Let's stop Data API Builder from running. And uh, what I need to do is just uh, update let me clear this, update the entities where I want to add the relationship. So let's do, let's do a DAP update and let's start from the speaker. Update the speaker entity, add a relationship, name it session that will target the session object. So the session object is the one that I have defined before and is exactly this one. Uh, the cardinality is many, meaning that uh, a speaker can have many sessions, and the linking object uh, is this table. Now, the linking object is needed uh, because this is a many-to-many -many relationship, uh, and uh, uh, there are two objects, but three tables. And we need to tell the type builder what is this third table that will be used behind the scene to um, uh, sustain the many-to-many -many relationship. We don't want that table to be surfaced as a GraphQL object, so that's why we are specifying this uh, additional parameter here, linking object, uh, that uh, specify we specify the table that we that will stay behind the scene, but still be used by the TP builder to sustain the many-to-many -many relationship. Now, since this is a many-to-many -many relationship, I'm now going to add the other side of the relationship, so the sessions, and. Uh, as you can see the session, again, I'm updating the session, adding the speaker relationship that is targeting, targeting the speaker object. It's a many-to-many -many relationship, so, so also the cardinality here is many, and I'm using, of course, the same table behind the scene that I used before. Perfect, now the relationship section has been added to my, uh, to my entities, and all I have to do right now is do dub start. And automatically, Data API Builder will uh, identify what columns are to be used to sustain the relationship. Uh, so you don't have to manually specify the column that uh, exists in the table in order to make sure that the Data API Builder knows which one to use to join the session table to the speaker's table. The Data API Builder will try to figure it out on its own. In the case that the builder cannot figure it out on its own, for example, because there is no foreign key or because there are ambiguities, you can always specify the values uh, manually. Uh, now, there are no values because they are automatically uh, um, retrieved, but otherwise I could have specified here, for example, ID or any other column that I wanted to use to sustain the relationship. Perfect. Now, I, uh, now the API Builder is running. I can 
can go back to my GraphQL query and here now in the speakers I can refresh the schema and here I should find the session object now. Perfect. And now the session object is there because uh, we added the relationship and now I can ask for the session to in the title for the session and here we go. You see that David Fowler will present um, to session, welcome to .NET 8 and performance improvements in .NET, uh, .NET 8, SP Core and other stuff. Now let's go back uh, to the original query on the sessions. Uh, here I wanted to see what are the speakers that uh, are speaking at this session. And now I have the object uh, because I created the relationship. So here I can ask for the full name. And very nicely, here I have the answer with the title of my session and all the speakers that speak to this to that session. All done in GraphQL, uh, the query is built for us behind the scene by Data API Builder, and we don't have to worry about anything, right? So we just go to the HTML page and uh, make sure that uh, we issue the right command, and this looks correct to me, so let me copy uh, and uh, uh, create a new query here just to try it out. Uh, Nice, all my session, perfect. So the query runs, I should be able to run it uh, in, uh, in the HTML page. So let me open this page uh, with uh, live server and uh, what will happen is that it will not run. And probably you know already why, because uh, uh, this is answering on a, a server and on a port uh, and while the API Builder is uh, running on another one. And this means that course will kick in and will prevent uh, my website to connect to my backend. In fact, if I do .NET 8 here and uh, run the search, nothing will happen if I show you uh, the error because course is preventing uh, two different um, servers to communicate to each other. Now, uh, in DTP Builder, we also support uh, uh, course configuration. So all you have to do is stop DTP Builder from running in order to change the configuration of file, go to course section. And in this case, I'm enabling just for the demo all uh, origins and I start DTP Builder again. Otter load is coming soon, uh, but for now I have to manually stop and start DTP Builder. Now I can go back here, refresh my... Uh, HTML page and now I have all the session and it's working pretty nicely. Now I can also search for a specific session and if they only return the session that uh, uh, contains exactly that content. Here we go. Perfect. And if I click here, uh, in this case, uh, I'm just using the rest endpoint. Uh, I will just go to directly to the specific session and see the JSON data returned by the rest endpoint. Um, that's, that's pretty much it. It, is, it has been a very quick demo, 10 minutes, because the TP Builder is exactly uh, as easy as you have seen to use, to set up and to run. And uh, uh, now basically you can just create your backend for your frontend or for your microservices uh, and just forget about uh, all the issues about pagination, filtering, ordering, doing it uh, uh, correctly, managing uh, N plus one uh, problems with the GraphQL, uh, uh, publishing the Swagware details, the Swagger detail for uh, REST, everything is taken care of for you by Data API Builder. Uh, last, uh, last thing I want you to know is that uh, right now we are not using uh, um, authentication, but here we could define who can, uh, for example, read from uh, the speaker table. Uh, I could have said here authenticated, and this would have been that uh, I need to perform authentication, for example, using Active Directory or GitHub, uh, in order to be able to execute, uh, uh, in this case, a GET request on my speaker table or a query using GraphQL. You have a complete control over the security. You can even do complex, more complex stuff uh, like what we call policies. Uh, for example, you can set that um, you want to have a claim uh, that, uh, for example, contains, let's say that uh, you receive a, a token with a claim that contains the email and you want the email to be equal to the item dot owner email. So in this case, for example, uh, if I will try to connect to the speaker endpoint and I have been authenticated. What will happen is that I will only be able to see the rows for which 
the owner email column is equal to the email value I have in my claim after I've been authenticated. So this allows you to define a very strict and fine-grained row-level policy or low-level security. So you can be sure that also security is completely taken care of for you uh, uh, by the API Builder. Now with that, let's go back to the slide and finish the session. As you have seen the demo, it, it's really, really easy to set up a, a data API builder to, for example, uh, allow you to publish a session and create a nice website uh, where to publish uh, session uh, information, allow people to search for a session and you know build just a regular conference website. Now, we built everything uh, offline on my machine. Now, if we want to deploy everything, uh, I can use, as said at the beginning, static apps, and that's exactly the first uh, service I would recommend you to, uh, to use uh, to play with Data API Builder, uh, because you have a free tier, Data API Builder is also free, you can use, an, you can use uh, uh, Azure SQL free tier, for example, to make uh, some experimentation, and you can just deploy the full website uh, uh, in just one shot. Um, to use Data API Builder with static apps, we even uh, uh, did an uh, integration with Static Web App CLI. So you can just do everything from a Static Web App, Static Web App, SWA, CLI, DB init, and then you initialize the, the Data API Builder configuration file so that uh, it specifically built in order to work well with Static Web Apps. And then uh, you continue to use Dub Client, uh, Dub CLI as you did before. Uh, nothing has changed. You just point to this configuration file, and then you 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 add the entities and everything as regular. Um, something more complex, end-to-end uh, -end website uh, is sessionfinder.netconf.net that you already used to find and search for session. That website is completely built using the API Builder. It uses a React application to uh, basically present the UI. The React application communicates with the API Builder. The API Builder uses SQL database behind the scene to store session data along with uh, embeddings and vectors. And SQL database is also used to search for similar session doing cosine distance calculation right into database. And database also works with OpenAPI to transform the search, the search index text that you have specified in the query string uh, into an embedding and then, uh, and then uh, uh, use it to search uh, uh, the most similar session uh, stored in database. Um, there is also some event-driven uh, programming here because uh, there is a function trigger that uh, automatically updates the embedding whenever, uh, whenever a session text, uh, like an abstract of the title, is changed. So you really have a very nice demo and full solution that you can deploy in your subscription and you can take inspiration from to build your own AI-powered application uh, so that you can focus on the AI part, on the adding the value for your users, and you just leave the API Builder doing the um, heavy load, the heavy work, uh, and uh, when, when you need to uh, expose some uh, um, table view or story procedure. Everything is on GitHub and uh, uh, make sure that you check it out because I think it is a really cool uh, example that you can use uh, as a starting point. Now, some resources, of course, uh, .NET 8, but also the API Builder, aka.ms slash DAB. Make sure to check that out. It's open source. We really want your contribution and your feedback. And actually, let me show you the website here. Here we go, aka slash ms slash dab and uh, you have uh, uh, also the discussion section where you can even have access to the full roadmap uh, propose your ideas uh, uh, report an issue so just make sure to you know come and visit it's a really cool project and uh, then also make sure to check out the session recommender example. It's really an amazing project. It shows the full end-to-end, -end, uh, including uh, AI. Uh, actually, let me uh, let me go and open it uh, right away. Here we go. Session recommender. As you can see, you have the full code. The full architecture is here. So you have the client in React, the database, uh, uh, the um, Azure Functions uh, and the Data API Builder configuration uh, file. So you can, it's very easy. You can just fork it and deploy it. And uh, basically, you will be, uh, be creating uh, this application here, right? So exactly the same application you've been using. Uh, so let's look for GraphQL. And that's the session you will be using. And in, in this 
few millisecond Azure SQL perform the uh, vector search uh, using also open API to the code the GraphQL into vectors. That's pretty amazing. So make sure to check it out. Now back to slides. Uh, other uh, other uh, resources here for you, uh, best practices, uh, awesome Azure SQL list, uh, again, the TPA Builder and uh, the book uh, me and other uh, colleagues wrote around uh, Azure SQL, uh, uh, especially if you are starting uh, uh, coding, you definitely want to check that out. Uh, and with that, uh, that's all from me. Enjoy the remaining part of uh, .NET Conference 2003. See you next year. Bye-bye.